Hey everybody, Ryan here from Music City Live. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Darren Walters from the Walters family, singer, songwriter, uh, studio owner, producer, fiddle player, man of many musical hats. Promoter now. Promoter now. Yeah. That's almost more than anything I do now. It's promoting shows, yeah. but you yeah. Just, you just came off the road, right? Yeah. Uh, about a month ago. It was good. Went in the States for a bunch of shows and zipped across Canada from Halifax to Vancouver and the States too. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's starting to branch out more and doing more U S States. And there's only so many places to perform in Canada. Right. So once you've hit all of them, yeah. <laughs> once you hit them all and you've done them multiple times, you're like, ah, let's try the U S and, and, uh, so it's, it's good. It's hit and miss now. What kind of, si- what size venues are you filling there? Uh, 800 to 2,500 seat. Oh, wow. Soft seaters. Yeah, so. Is there a particular area of the U.S. you're focused on, or are you going all over? Uh, East Coast, for now. We did a bunch of Wisconsin dates. We did a bunch of Florida dates. Um, So, a bunch of places we've been before. Uh, Brian Edwards, who I I work with uh, out of Peterborough, he's done all the red-green tours and stuff. Oh, that's cool. So, we've done all these venues uh, before with red green. So we kind of mm. went to a lot of them that we were, Hey, this was a good spot. This was a good spot. You know, we liked it here. And then I found a bunch of new ones that we haven't been to and tried them. And so nice. it's different. You know, you're comfortable with Canada, you know, it, you know, every single venue, you know, everyone's there. Well, almost everyone's getting fired now, which is yeah. interesting. You go in and like the whole place is new. Like wow. everyone's gone or, the TD is now booking all the entertainment. Uh, that's a new one. And uh, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, last week I was advancing shows. Now I'm booking all of them. And it's wow. like, I don't know what I'm doing. Because uh, <laughs> it's not the same. Oh, no, no, no. I think a lot of people think because you're in the theater and you're the TD and, you know, you must know how to book shows. Nothing to do with one another. You know, they're they're not the same beast at all. No, not at all. And I've done both. Uh you know, I book shows at our theater all the time. Uh, and I've been doing that for years and I've been a TD and they're just not the same negotiating skills once. <laughs> they're completely different. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I get it. And is it for the better or for the worse in some case? Like, it sounds like it's almost for the worse right now in the beginning stages, right? In some places it's for the worse, right? Yeah. It's in some places, you know, you got staff that's been there forever. You know them, they know their routine, they know their clientele. They know what sells, what doesn't sell. Um, but the new people, they just, they don't, they're being shuffled in and they have no experience, right? right? So they just don't understand the process or how to deal with promoters, how to deal with local people who want to book the theater. Um, it, it's complicated. Uh, it, it's a mess to some degree. Uh, we're trying to get a tour started for the spring and trying to get theaters to go on sale for Christmas, right? And they're like, a lot of venues are like, what do you want to be on on sale before Christmas for? Oh my. <laughs> and they're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> like our audience, you know, the people, our crowd that the show tours that we're doing cater to an older audience. Sure. And it's a perfect ticket for Christmas gifts. Christmas gifts, you 100%. know, for your mom and dad or whoever you have to buy for. You Absolutely. Know, gonna, it's perfect. And we, just last, like, last year in Florida for my grandparents, we got them a Christmas gift to go to see a show. And there was an Elvis tribute going on yeah. in town. And we got my parents and my grandparents tickets to go see it. And that was because it's a great gift for like, because when you're that age, you have everything and you need nothing. Yeah. So perfect. why not get them experiences? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah it's that's the crazy. perfect gift. And and these are these are from venues where managers and front of house staff have been there for 30 years. And they're like, Oh, we've never thought about that before. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's not parts of that staff. It's not their job to think about that. Normally no. speaking, right? No, there are so there's so many staff members in a lot of these venues. Like I'm so used to uh, my our venue, our family venue, which we have the Walters Music Venue. We've been doing that 23 years, and it's just us, right? It's mm-hmm. you know you're used to family business, so it's like. Yeah you it's you and as least amount of people as possible right for us we keep it tight so it's myself my brother my sister and my mom and it's you know you make a decision and it gets done uh and you know all aspects of what's going on 
but some of these venues we go to, they have a front of house person that, you know, comes in and he's your person that deals with people coming into the theater and deals with the merch and kind of stuff like that. Sure. They'll have eight people that do that job. And you'd be like, ah, oh. okay. They're like, yeah, I, yeah, we're, we're really busy this month. I, I'm in here four times. <laughs> and we're like, four? Wow. wow. Really? Four times in the whole month. How do you manage it? <laughs> but they're just, they're so, so much staff, right? They have right. so much money from the city or from government funding uh, that they just, they just hire tons of people sure. and nobody knows what's going on. So for them, it seems busy, but there's just so much miscommunication that nobody talks to one another. So, you know, people in the front of house don't talk to the tech people and the tech people don't want to deal with anyone from up there. Uh, and then there's all this. So you get to a venue and you could be a simple show and nobody knows what's going on no one's advanced properly or no one's told the person in the front house this is happening or that so and i'm looking at i'm coming in super simple we're trying to tour now which is as easy as possible and i'm thinking wow what if i pulled up with like four tractor trailer loads of <laughs> equipment and a bunch of crew that must be really interesting but yeah no doubt but so you know you make it work you're uh so so the the venues on the on the like a family the family farm right in dutton is yeah and bright Brighton, right? Yeah. Sorry. Not Brighton, Bright. Right. Yeah. Two oh, different yeah, places. That's right. Yeah. 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 So just between Kitchen and Woodstock. So yeah, about in 2000, um, we decided to make our own uh, theater at our property. So we had this beautiful 200 year old barn that we've always kept up and we converted it into- you got a picture of that, right? Yeah. It should be somewhere in there. You see it? Yeah. There we go. That one there. Perfect. So- we converted Beautiful. that into uh, a theater and we did a dinner theater for a very long time up until COVID. Uh, and then during COVID, we switched to being just a strict music venue. Okay. Uh, so we do 120 shows a summer. Wow. Uh, and that's awesome. Pound it out. Yeah. How many shows a week is that? That's every day. Wow. And lots of double days. Um, so that was uh we're not quite back at 120 now since covid um but it's every year now it's we're adding more and a bit more trying the, to get back what's the capacity uh 180 180 so 180 yeah. people at least once a day almost every day all summer long yeah that's crazy that's <laughs> that's <good>. busy <laughs> yeah to, to go back to what you're saying earlier right yeah you're tired by the by the end of september like in the middle of september i'll be you know we'll be doing shows and and I, I do all the tech there as well. So I'll be in the middle of the show and I'm on my phone looking at cruises. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a little break. I think there's about 20 seconds and I don't need to do anything. And it was like, hey, we're gonna go. there's a good cruise and then in October. Yeah. <laughs> so you get awesome. antsy to kind of like, okay, I've had enough, but uh, it's fun. It's, it's a neat, it's a beautiful venue. It's really pretty high tech for um, what it is. People are kind of blown away that, you know, I've, yeah. 40 moving lights and uh the sounds system's great sounds good and it's all wood and, totally. um so i mean I you might play. expect that at like a big city you know theater venue or something but even then like i know a lot of theaters that don't even have that many moving lights you know i mean i just like i said just did a tour on 24 theaters across canada and i would put my rig up to almost every single one there's maybe about three or four venues that i said yeah they got me beat every other venue i was like oh gosh my little 180 seat theater just blows us away yeah it's crazy but, so how do you pick what goes in there in terms of like the shows how does that work it changes all the time like when you take 24 years ago when we started we primarily kind of did country you know we kind of cater to a 50 55 and up crowd um a lot of country uh, a lot of old nostalgic 50s and 60s shows big band shows stuff like that now we jump ahead 23 years and then that genre of music's moved ahead 20 years right, right. so where we'd have a country show that would be more like a uh, like a patsy klein like real old 
style country. Now we're doing like 90s country. That seems to be mm. like, that's old country now. Um, so yeah. Garth Brooks, when he started all that stuff. Um, we have an Alabama Zach Brown show coming in the summer and it's like, it's pretty well like 20 seats from being sold out two shows just bam done. Wow. and so it's like wow that's kind of surprising me and um you don't know it's changed and since covid it nothing makes sense anymore like it you had we had it figured i think we had it pretty well figured out we knew what to book we knew what people were going to want to come see and we just kind of tweaked it every year a little bit sure now it's sort of like I don't know. I mean, don't understand why this show is selling better than this show. Uh, even on the road, uh, this tour I just did, it's a show called Old What a Night, uh, tribute to Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Nice. And done hundreds of shows on the road with them. And going back to venues we've done many times and been very successful at this venue. And you go back the next time, it's like, okay, it's not, how come it's not selling as well here? But this X venue is like, going gangbusters when it's always struggled before right wow. so yeah it's bizarre right it's almost yeah. it's almost like the maybe the age demographic is has got to get a little older in certain spots and then some people are maybe dying off in other spots i don't know it's it's but you there's no you, way to you know. talk to every venue and they're they're saying they're they're basically saying yeah we don't understand what's going on could be economic too yeah some shows are going crazy selling really well other shows it seems one or the other either you're like selling out doing really well or you've got 100 people in a thousand seat theater mm. uh, so it's it's really hit i think what's happened um since covid there was this push right at the very beginning when everything opened up of everyone going on a tour but then there's still a bunch of people that kind of like yeah, i don't i don't let's not go on the first round right right now we're kind of been through the second year since everything opened up and then everyone's touring again plus all those people who like were well i don't know are now okay okay let's go so there's an abundance of shows um we just booked a theater in uh fort lauderdale but we just did uh in the fall beautiful theater we booked uh, a show for the spring and currently the manager just told uh my business partner brian says they are booked every day till the end of june wow every day there's not a day open that's wild yeah for in fort lauderdale wow that's pretty crazy but a lot of places are like that you try to you try to book a venue there's eight holds on a day or six holds on a day um wow so there's a lot of people trying to get out there and do shows so i think what's going to happen i think it's going to peak or haven't maybe it's peaked already so a lot of people have gone out and toured and it wasn't successful they're going to like rethink it so yeah. i think there's not going to be another year maybe another two years it will kind of level back out to something that's a little bit more reasonable um and i think it that will kind of weed out the people who didn't do well and the people who did well will just keep We'll keep rolling. Yeah. And, keep and you can see that a lot of the big shows are really cutting down. A lot of the Canadian country acts are just touring as like an acoustic thing, you know, keeping yep. it production really low, um, you know, doing a two or three piece thing. Um, hmm. And it's just too, too expensive. Yeah. Buses are expensive. Well, Hotels really are expensive. Flights are expensive. Rentals, gas is expensive. Um, you add it all up. It, no oh yeah it's a difference no it's wild and people don't have any idea right what this all this stuff costs like it makes people's heads spin when you know you, you tell them how much it is to wash a bus let alone fill it up with gas like yeah. let alone rent it let alone have a driver and then you need a room for the driver to sleep and and you know it's like you know but people out there have no clue and and so you know it it's yeah it's all going up and it, it would it's certainly getting harder and harder to keep those ticket prices down like i just went to uh to the last kiss show ever at madison square gardens and i tell people what i paid and i i mean i was up in the you know the 200s on the side i certainly wasn't on the floor 
the floor seats were five grand US a piece. Wow. Yeah. And, and I mean, granted, it was the last kiss show ever yeah. at Madison Square Gardens. But, you know, I mean, I'm looking at the average ticket, even in Canada, I'm looking at the average ticket uh, um, and certainly not, you know, floor front, front three rows. I'm talking just floors in general. You know, you're looking at at least a thousand or twelve hundred dollars Canadian yeah. for floor seats at, at the average big, you know, big ticket show. Um, and I do go to a lot of shows in Detroit, too. And, and it's the same down there. You know, I, I was looking at Kenny Chesney tickets because Kenny's uh, touring with Zach Brown. Yeah. And I, I want to go so bad because I yeah. love them both. But man, the tickets are insane. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, my ticket for Kiss was 500 US. Yeah. Um, and I was in the 200s. Um, and so, you know, there's only the other thing, too, is that, you know, to go to a show, sometimes it's, it's as, a, as, a, as a person attending, it's easy when the tickets are, let's say, you know, a couple hundred bucks or less Canadian, because, you know, that's something that someone, if they're even remotely a fan, can easily kind of swallow to go, yeah, I'll go check them out. But when you get up to 500 US, like, you know, yeah. and 38 cents on the dollar with exchange on the credit card, all of a sudden you're talking, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars Canadian a ticket. Well, now you got to find a pretty big fan, especially yeah. if you're going out, you know, out of your area. Like if you're going to Detroit or you're going over the border, got to be a pretty big fan to go with you to check out the show. Right. So chances are your significant other may or may not be a fan of the, who it is, depending on who it is. Like Kiss, my wife was like, I don't want to go to Kiss. Yeah. You know, so I found a buddy that was willing to, to go, but it, it's it, it makes it hard you know, to get the prices to that, where you, you have to go to that level to justify the production and, the, and the, and the, all that stuff on the road. And, you know, God forbid something happens, you know, they canceled the Toronto and Ottawa shows. Yeah. And that. I can't even imagine what that cost, like yeah. just to keep that, that package together for two days to do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's no, you know, the production company is not giving away, Oh, we didn't do a show. Well, we won't charge you for that. It's, well, they were, it's, they were in the venue. They were, yeah, they were set up. up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in Toronto. Like we had tickets to go, uh, or I, I know someone had tickets to go to that show and it was like, it was ready to go. Yeah. And they called it off. Right. So yeah, it, it's, uh, and the same thing happened with Aerosmith. I had tickets to that Aerosmith show that got canceled uh, in Toronto. And the same thing blew his voice out yeah. <clears throat> and it got rescheduled to February. And now I just got an email a couple of weeks ago that it's, it's, it's on hold. It's being rescheduled again sometime, maybe, um, if his voice comes back, right? So <clears throat> you can imagine the loss on that tour yeah. when it just grinded to a halt, right? Because um, those are big shows. Yeah, it's hard to hard to tell on some of those big shows whether that's who takes the loss on that, if that's a Live Nation loss uh, or if that's a, you know, a KISS loss. Because sometimes there's you know, there's a guarantee for some of those big tours where we're going to give you, you know, this amount of money. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. So whether, you know, who takes the loss there is hard, hard to know. It depends on what the deal is. Yeah. Uh, but nice. there's, there's a loss. There is, um, yeah. But sure. there's a lot of money being made in those big tours. Yep. Um, and like you said, with those type of prices, people want to go see those artists like the one like the like you spent the money on kiss because it's it's the last show you don't know whether you're going to see them again or it's been five years since you've seen them so you take all these people going out and seeing you know spending 500 bucks a ticket or whatever it is or a thousand bucks a ticket and then what's left for everybody else yeah right right because how many times can you do that in that's, a year that's the thing you, you, you can't yeah. with groceries and everything being I, I i've been out a little bit doing some Christmas shopping and it's not busy. No, it's not. No, you're right. It, it was like shockingly quiet. Um, I think sometime maybe later, later in the day, but usually this time of year, it's busy right from when they open to when they close. And yeah, and it's everyone I've been talking to, they said, yeah, it's, it's, it's down. Yeah, it's down for sure. I yeah. went to the, the big mall here in the North end and uh, you know, normally you can't find a parking spot and I parked, 20 feet from the door and I walked in mind you I walked in an entrance that not a lot of people normally walk in but I walked in the, you know an entrance right off Richmond Street right off the main road yeah. and uh walked into the mall and and I'm looking around I'm going wow like it's it's a normal if anything it's a normal day at the mall 
or maybe even less. Yeah. Like it was weird. It was a bizarre. Now you have certain stores like, you know, the Apple store and certain stores that obviously all the time have, a, you know, people, but they're all window shopping half the time. Right. Yeah. And so it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's a weird time. Um, you know, I bought a lot of gifts this year um, <clears throat> in store. Like I physically went out, you know, and only a couple of them I ordered online. My wife's the complete opposite. You know, she yeah. bought everything online. So there's that too, right? And I mean, I run an online store here. So I know like we see, you know, we see thousands and thousands of people online every month shopping on our online store. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and they're buying guitars, which is a super personal item, right? Yeah. But, but you know, you know, the pandemic pushed us into that. Like it's, it's, it's been a, you know, buying guitars online has been a thing in the US for years now. Um, but, and they do a really good job at it down there, certain companies. But, um, you know, when we're stepping up our game, because we realize, well, that's the new, the new, the new world of, of buying guitars, especially ones that are like 1200, a thousand and down is online. And, yeah. and people asked me, I had a couple buddies asked me this, you know, last week or so, you know, how many, how many entry level guitars and starter packs and things are you selling? And I'm like, on our platform, not a lot. Yeah. Um, because you know, a lot of that's being bought on, on other platforms on the, on the more consumer driven platforms, whereas we cater more to the professionals, right? Like yourself. Yeah. And so what we get a lot of is we get a lot of the, uh, um, you know, parents buying their kids, the next guitar, like not the first guitar, but the, you know, the, uh, the, the used American Strat or the, or the, you know, the, the, the Mexican telly or whatever it is, uh, the, the next sort of step. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, and they go online and they do the research and, but yeah, the online thing is, is, uh, is affecting it too, uh, big time. So it's a combination of that and the economy and, and just, you know, money's tight. And so, yeah, yeah. dramatic going back to what you were saying, it, you know, keeping the tours small, like going back to what you're saying about the Canadian country guys, I think that that makes sense. You know, like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's a wise move as opposed to, you know, coming off the road and go, well, well, let's wait it out. It's like, well, yeah, but you'll become irrelevant in this world real fast with the amount of music coming out, the amount of things going on. Like you said, there's, there's no dates in some of these venues. There's so yeah. much going on that, you know, if, if you're gone for a year or two, you're a dinosaur. Like yeah. it's, it's in my opinion, anyway, that's, it's moving that fast. So. Well, the thing you hear and see a lot online now is the acts being really open about how much money they're making. And I've seen it on a, a few podcasts kind of YouTube things I follow where they're, they're starting to talk about, you know, opening acts and people going on the road and explaining that we're making zero, you know, by the time we come home or, you know, the leaders of the bands are coming and they're making on a big show, they're making three, four 500 bucks a piece. And they're like, wow, you know, people actually start to talk about it because there's a big divide, I think, from the people who are really doing the big dollars, those big, big tours. Yeah. They've upped their games, you know, doing stadiums. And, you know, I'm not sure how much further you can go than doing a stadium. I think, uh, you know. Maybe you sure know, Lollapalooza much. or something like a yeah. really big festival. You know what I mean? Yeah. But those are far and few between too. Especially yeah. Here and that's Canada. a festival. It's not a, not, it's a tour not stop, any. right? Yeah, it's not a tour stop. Yeah. So they're pushing the limit. And, and they're filling these places, you know, like 90, yeah. 80, 90,000 people. And, and it's like, wow, that's a lot of people. And where do you, so those people pulling some big dollars, but then you take a look at the medium tours and you hear people talking and they're coming back with, you know, by the time they pay catering and, and all these other things. And then everyone starts taking a piece of the pie. I got a manager, <laughs> I've got an agent, I got this, I got that. And everyone thinks, you know, they need all that. Um, and it's like, you don't always need all of that. Or they don't feel they need to negotiate or, you know, you, you have to kind of look after yourself. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you're always surprised on, on, I think when people start talking about it a lot, you know, it's bad. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a few select few that are, I think, doing really, really well. And I think everyone else is hurting. Um, perspective is everything yeah. right yeah like it's good that they're talking about it because it gives a perspective to people out there and i think um good time to touch on the topic that i love touching on is is you know mentoring and and education tribal knowledge all those things that i talk about on this show is is super important um 
you know, so you, you have people that are out there touring, doing their thing, talking about it, which is great because young people coming up then can have a perspective that people before them didn't have. Yeah. Right. And, and, but they have, but that my thing is, you know, the younger people have to be listening. You know, my concern with a lot of the younger people right nowadays is because they have access to Google and the internet and social media, you know, they're, 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 they're the all powerful. They don't, they don't need the information and tribal knowledge from their family, from their, from the past, from, from yeah. these mentors, these people who have been there, done it. Right. But I think it's the opposite. I think the few young people that dial into these types of podcasts and these types of shows and that find the people like yourself that, that, that have been there and done that and, and have that, that knowledge and, and they seek them out and, and they find their mentors, whether it's musical mentors or, or technical mentors or whatever it is, but you need to, you need that along the way. You, you need that as part of your team and part of your journey. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I think that that's, you know, that's one of the big reasons why I'm doing this is to bring the community back together again. Um, yeah, it's, it's really important. I mean, I heard on the road in this last tour, uh, a lot of venues, especially in the U S there's, they're short staffed everywhere. There's not, there's not enough crew in any city to cover the shows that are coming in. So it's crazy. The odds crews, they're down, you know, keep bringing COVID up, but it really has been a big factor. Um, a lot of guys just retired, you know, they, uh, story after story I heard, yeah, they just went up there, their fishing cabin and just hung out for a year or so and decided I really like this and decided they don't want to feel like pushing road cases around anymore. And they just retired and the new kids coming in, they're hiring whoever they can. Some of them don't know how to put a mic stand together. And they're trying to get the older guys to mentor and teach. I said, majority of them, no interest. Yeah. They, you know, why should I show you? And it's like, it's not the right way to do it. No. Because someone showed them. Yeah. Right. Because when, when we grew up, there wasn't YouTube videos just showing you how to do nope. everything. <laughs> you just figured it out, right? And I think which is really powerful for people of our age um, who are still eager to learn. And I do that every day. I'm super eager to learn every day. Um, so now you have old knowledge from, you know, knowing how to troubleshoot and knowing how to figure it out because you had to. Plus now you've got videos online and, and all these things to kind of confirm <laughs> what you think. It's like, before I should do that, I should look at a couple of videos and then you confirm that, yeah, you're right. Or say, oh, I've been doing that wrong for the last 20 years. And then you make yourself better. But I think there's that, um, it's almost like old school audio guys who learned on analog consoles who are now on digital consoles as opposed to young guys who just learned plugins and computer and digital consoles. Yeah. There's a big difference between huge those people without having the old knowledge. Um, and that's what the younger kids need to learn. The almost as if, you know, a lot of people should just start out on more simple mm -hmm. um, gear. I, you know, I remember starting my uh my family started as a as a band when i i started playing when i was four and actually doing gigs wow. when i was four four and a half my daughter's four now i should i should get her going yeah doing gigs so i look back then you know we had pretty printed primitive equipment right you had like a i don't even remember what the first uh equipment we had like some type of sure little mixer with some columns and then i remember moving to uh a PV console, um, you know, but simple. You learned where to set your gain. You you learned how to listen to figure out what the EQ did instead of looking on a screen and watching, you know, yep. a waveform kind of go up. And visually, you're doing something. No, you're using your ears every single time you do something. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that those things are super important just kind of i see a lot of guys now in studios and i've been thinking about it in in my studio for a setup is actually moving the monitor away mm. and approaching things as you know maybe have your mixer up um 
and or have some type of hybrid mixer up and but you're not really looking at um you know eq graphs and everything sure you just listening and then you can go turn and make an adjustment come back and keep your eyes off plugins and monitors yeah i never thought about it that way but that's yeah. super relevant yeah yeah i think it's a smart idea because everyone is has turned everything into a visual right so you're everything you're hearing you're seeing yes as a some type of uh you know graphic knowledge of okay i'm you know this is what i'm doing oh look you know and everyone you see it online people will post a picture of their you know this is my channel strip of you know of my vocal tonight and you can see the waveform and people are you know have a list a mile long saying why would you ever eq something like that that looks terrible and it's like yeah but what did it sound like totally like it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there right if it yeah. sounds good you know you're not you don't go to a concert and go back and kind of go I wonder what that EQ curve was on that vocal. So if you go see it, there's no way he would have done that, right? If you've seen what they were doing half the time or what people do to make it work, you know, you just kind of, if you have to EQ the crap out of something, you do it. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. I mean, I, <clears throat> I was in studios when I was super young with my dad and remember those days of just having a Neve console and there was, you know, there might've been a Pro Tools rig in the back you know, corner of the room, but it was in the back corner of the room. Like it was about, you know, the artists on the floor, you know, the right mics and the right spots, you know, turn it up, let's go. And, and, you know, that brings up a good point. Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, session players um, because uh, I know part of, so we met through my dad yeah, um, and you guys, uh, he was doing a, a project called Little Rock uh with you um which he still talks about reviving at some point yeah <laughs> um but uh yeah uh and i remember him coming home uh you know i think it was after the first or second sort of the first day and he was just like in he was just he had this look on his face and he was like i can't believe what i just saw i can't believe what i just heard and saw and and the way he explained it to me at the time was he's like you know i I always, you know, I always used to think that the, it was the, the guys in the band should should play their own, you know, their own tunes. And he goes, but I list, I, I saw these guys, these session guys come in, and they just, they they <laughs> they just blew my mind. They had the charts there, and they just they went, and it was, it was insane. And so that was because I was younger then. That was my sort of first time even hearing about a session musician was session musician what is that and yeah. then you know obviously since then i've gotten to to know it very well and gotten to 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 know quite a few of them um chappy i think who worked on that little rock project's actually yeah. been here at charterhouse quite a few times yeah paul chapman yeah um yeah he's there there's very few guys that can do it or very few guys that can do it well that i would call like a real session guy right yeah yeah that you hire just comes in and and you know they're there just to either they're there to do exactly what you tell them to do or sometimes as a producer if i'm producing a project i don't necessarily know a hundred percent i'm exactly i want this song to sound exactly like this and i want everybody's part to sound exactly the way i tell them um hopefully you're smart enough to hire guys it's like being a ceo of a company right you hire guys around you to make you look good sure and you just manage it and that's what the producer's job is half the time is you hire the right people for the right gig and you just make sure it you know they all managed sure and let them do their thing um and then you know times you say no oh i like that what were you doing there you know they might be just noodling and and as a player, you're just noodling, but I might all of a sudden you go, oh, what were you doing there? Yeah, let's let's try that. Um, it's like the Eddie Van Halen solo on Beat It. You know? Yeah, it's like a very commercial example, but yeah, it's like it's like yeah, I'm gonna I need a guitar solo here. Well, there's a guy. <laughs> Get you know, there's many levels of session players. Sure, right? yeah. There's you know, you know, I say A, B, C, or those super freak musicians that are just 
you know, beyond amazing. Um, it, it, it's pretty neat when you get a, you know, a really great group of guys. I remember, um, for a long time, I used a core set of guys in my studio and they were, you know, the great players, really, really good. But then there's a few guys from Toronto I've always kind of heard about, you know, like uh, Pepe Francis is one one guy. Um, and I was always nervous about hiring them because I thought, am I, as a producer and an engineer, up to their level, right? Right. And I decided to go for it uh, on a project. And it was mind boggling. Like I was the same <laughs> probably for your for your dad when he came in and did the session with me. It was that for me when I hired like the AA plus guys. Wow. It was like, holy smokes. And on top of that, the nicest guys ever. Yeah, he like, said that too. Yeah. No attitudes. Um you know, they just, they're there, they know what they're there for, um, and they get the job done. And it's always really good. That sounds like a great, that sounds like a great producer gig to have in that case, right? Like it's. Yeah. And you get spoiled, right? Totally. And you get some sessions where you'll have a band that comes in and it's all day just, you know, getting sounds or, or, you know, trying to get a track that's in time. Um, and it's frustrating when you're used to just having you know someone come in and like the second pass it's yeah yeah it's good let's move on <laughs> next that's and awesome. you know those are you get used to that right just kind of it's a speed thing um and when you get people who aren't used to it and you're used to doing it that way it's difficult uh you got to really like the guys you're working with you got to really um like the music or else it's 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 kind of a little bit of torture um <laughs> just to try to get through the day because you want you know you, they're close right sure and you're pushing them to do you know do you know it's like an athlete or something you know you, you can do that 100 meter dash in a certain amount of seconds but you know you can go that bit faster right? and you try to pull that out of musicians and every every musician has a little extra in them that you have and that's part of a producer's job is to figure out if they're performing at their peak or there's a little bit more singers are the worst because singers always dependent on what's ever happening in their lives at the time and that's just singing for me is all mental if you're in a good place mentally you can come in um and, and nail it but I've I've done sessions where I've sent the singer home before they even sang. Oh wow! Where they kind of come in and be like, "How you doing?" Oh, well, I had a, <laughs> this, and you know, I had a something with my husband, and and we argued, and then you know, whatever. So, all right, see you tomorrow. And they're like, "What?" Yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, and not going to get the right performance. Yeah, unless you're doing a song that requires yeah. you know sure. some form of you know real sorrow or something like that then you're like okay let's let's just sing this song um and that's the trick it's being able to take yourself physically somewhere mentally in your head to uh be able to pour out emotion right and we've all known singers and players that you kind of go where does that come from right because most of the time i find a lot of those guys and gals who are really great at that when they're done they're like they're just yeah. normal, you know, everyday, nice people. And all of a sudden you tell them to, it's their time to, to do their take or do even doing a live performance. And as if they transport themselves somewhere else yeah, they and they on. can just turn it on for that. And then it's done back again, I'm here. And that's a, that's a tough thing to figure out, especially when you're starting. It's, if you can figure that out uh, mentally, how to get yourself to a place, your performances are way better, you know, yeah. for anything, drummer, bass player, guitar player, singer, background vocal, whatever you're doing. 
Uh, if you can mentally get yourself to a spot that the song requires. I had a singer I worked with for many, many years, was struggling to get um, a good vocal for this song. And it's it was a, a real kind of upbeat, needed lots of energy, right? Sure. It just wasn't, was dealing stuff in their lives and couldn't get themselves there. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to do it, you know? So it was like one o'clock in the afternoon, I went, looked on, on, uh, online and seeing, you know, I'm trying to remember what movie we went to. I said, there's, there was a, uh, I remember what movie. Anyways, it was a real action movie. Um, and with Will Smith and, um, I remember what it was, um, what it was. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Like Independence Day or something like that? No. Um, doesn't matter. Oh, good. Anyways, we went and it was just unbelievable energy for two hours like and we came out and we we're just yeah and i just sped it right back to the studio and got two amazing vocals awesome. and because the level was up got exactly what we need, and about the third one started to die off again oh, okay energy started but we got the vocal and it's just getting mentally to the right place to perform it um but you have to figure out that's another producer thing yeah 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 is that you're not there to kind of produce what everyone thinks you're doing you're trying to be part psychiatrist part friend part whatever just to make that person the best they can possibly be yeah i've watched the guys the uh, producer that we have here in the studio here i've watched him do the same thing mm -hmm. many times and it's it's he says the exact same thing you're you're the therapist you're the you know you're the shoulder to cry on you're the everything um session players uh i mean i've only really heard of them in either country or pop music um is there session players in other genres that you know of? yeah I, I believe so i mean that's where i'm comfortable in but i'm assuming jazz has got to be you know session yeah. guys to do this certainly like if you're doing any form of um orchestrated work you know um any movie soundtrack stuff that they bring in guys to perform. That's all going to probably be session players. Um, I think they probably exist in most um, genres, but you know, country really, you know, especially in the Nashville scene, that's, you know, for a long, long time, it's, it was just, it was the same guys playing on everything. Yeah. Like every song would be the same guys. And that's why kind of country got this kind of weird rap for all sounding the same. Cause mm -hmm. it was like, well, they were just turning and burning and it was the same guys playing everything. Right. And you know, it was all great. Um, it was just relying on good songwriting that, you know, made it work. I'd argue nowadays it's the same thing, like, you know, listen to new country now. And it's like, they're all using the same formula, you know, it's the same same tricks on every song and it's just you just listen to it over and over again it's not that the singers not good or the you know musicians aren't good it's all great it's just like is this the same guy that we just heard the song before because it sounds like the same guy and the production kind of sounds the same they break it all down to like nothing in the verses and then the courses everything comes in strong with the heavy guitars just pounding away and in the old days, you know, a verse would come along, especially in country, and it'd be like, it's the fiddle player's turn, or it's the steel guitar player's turn to take some licks, you know? Sure. Now it's just like, there are no licks. And no. there's, you listen to the verse and it just breaks <clears> down <throat> to like maybe a kick drum and a, a lo fi loop um, and someone singing or, or. It's a pop song. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And they just go <clears throat> full, full tilt in the course with everything they can possibly put into it and it's, there's no room for any licks or any you know i miss all that stuff right? i do all, too all the real tasty little playing that happens in between there's none of that anymore it's just a groove um it's a vibe um and it's just it i miss it, it too yeah. when when i watch some of these new country tours come through and they they have all their stuff that they do to tracks and then they'll be you know they'll do like a like an older song mm -hmm. like they'll do a cover 
And and that's an opportunity for the guys, the steel player and the guitar player to do the licks, right? Yeah. And they're really good at it. And it's and that's when I miss it. I'm like, ah, oh, I wish, I wish more of those songs that you guys wrote had that in it. Cause it's it's it really, it's actually a really cool piece to engage the crowd with, right? Like it yeah. gives the other players in the band a chance to engage with the crowd and and amp up that energy, right? Yeah. So yeah. I yeah, agree. it's your chance to kind of shine right as a musician right this is what i can do i feel sorry for you know a lot of guitar players especially in country now where it's like you know you have two or three guys and you know two of the guys are just playing power chords the whole time i mean there's there's no there's yeah. no souls they're just you know just you know being a, a cool looking dude and and letting it rip and and there's no real there's some souls but there's no licks. There's no any of that stuff. It's just chords, you know. It's just a heavy yeah. tone and just playing chords, and it's like that's got to get boring after a while. Um, we went to. Uh, I was supposed to take my my bro my brother and me bought tickets for my mom um, to go for her birthday to go see the last Eagles tour or what they called the last Eagles tour. Yeah, Henley kind of coming around again. <laughs> Henley kind of put it out on stage that they it might be another one run. Um, you know, if they all keep, keep, keep on this side of the, of the dirt, but it's, uh, um, my, my brother couldn't go. Uh, and uh, he was, he had to go on, uh, somewhere else. And, um, so my dad came and, uh, and it was meant to be. Um, it was in Detroit, a little Caesars Arena, um, which is Glenn Fry's hometown. Yeah. And it was, you know, his son is in the band with uh, with uh, Henley and and all the guys and and uh, what's his face, country guy, Vince Gill. Vince Gill was is in the band. And so, anyway, heavy, heavy. You know, if it is the last show in Detroit, you know, heavy, sort of crazy. You know, and and Glenn's family, I'm sure, was there, and because um, his son's on stage, and and so really cool place to see it and uh, anyway it was electric uh, i've seen them there before i saw them the the first tour after glenn passed away yeah. in that venue and uh almost in the exact same spot too seat wise but um my dad was meant to be there like he he walked away and he posted something on facebook you probably saw it i read it yeah but he he said he said you know i'll never see a show that good again and and when he talked to me privately about it he said he said you know it's hard enough to have, you know, two guitar players in a band, but there's six. He goes, there's six guitar players and they all play mm. and they all leave space for each other yeah. and they're all good and they all sing. Yeah. Right. And he said, that's just so unorthodox that, you know, and, and it was, it, and they just nailed it too. Right. They just, you know, they just nailed it. And, and and it wasn't just and the other thing he said is it w it wasn't just the um the performance it wasn't just the vocals it wasn't just the playing we look at it too from the production standpoint yeah and every single thing the camera angles the switching the the placement of the video walls what content went up on what wall at what time every single thing the lighting cues the colors they used the sound just everything was just flawless there was not a single flaw in the whole show yeah and that just i mean for him to be blown away i mean he's seen you know thousands of shows in his life and it, he it was pretty cool but going back to your point you know that kind of guitar playing and that kind of thing is is becoming a bit of a lost art uh, with with what you're talking about, right? With the new country and 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 there being no room for that, it'll come around. It, I I, I yeah. think it will. It'll come back. I I'm hoping it will come back a bit more traditional. And there's still some of that there. There's still artists doing that. Yeah. Um, I I don't listen to a lot of music now. I listen to a lot of podcasts in the car. But the other day, I just popped on you know top forty and and Luke Combs uh, was like the first thing I listened to. And it was like, I'm in my car. It's like, I've never heard a kick drum and a snare sound that good in my That's life. That's Jake. And Jake was here. He's in this building. Oh, yeah. He did a seminar here. Yeah. Him and Matt, the bass player, they came here and did a seminar. <sighs> but whoever mixed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was stellar. And uh, I, yeah, first thing I had to do is like, I got to listen to this in the studio. I mean, it's just to see how it translates. And it's like, wow. I, I can't believe. And then I just shuffled through, brought up the same playlist 
and I just shuffled through a bunch of songs and there wasn't anything drum wise that came as close to sounding as good as that that yeah. did. And uh, well they're pretty particular, man. Like when great the boys sound. were here, you know, they're they're pretty particular about their sound. And um uh Jake is up right now. I saw it this morning on social media. He's up for drummer of the year for the uh, Drumio Awards. Nice. Um, for country drummer of the year. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, um, definitely. Um, I I I bring up the the you know that topic of just the session players in general because I think it's something that's not really on, you know, especially in Canada, it's not really talked about a lot, you know. Um, and and these are all the kind of things I want to bring to the forefront because, you know, sometimes there's people that are in, you know, getting into music or into music and they're like, yeah, I'll never be a major touring guy or I'm, you know, but there's a, there's lots, like you said, there's lots of room for really good session players. Like there's not, like you said, there's not a ton of really good session players. So, you know, if you're really good at playing and you're really good at your craft and you hone in on that, that's a good, a good area. And, and, and also, you know, the technical side, like you said, there's not enough crew, there's not enough good sound people there's not enough guitar techs you know bungee that was a thing like when when the ladies went back on the road they took bungee well of course you know cochran and all these other people that he works with normally wanted to go on the road too yeah but you can't all have bungee he's gone yeah so there's just not enough there's not enough resources for a lot of people for for what they tried to do coming out of the, the pandemic but you know there's what, a lot there's missing a lot i mean a lot of I always, I harp on lighting guys a lot because um, there's very few really good lighting guys out there. Yes. Um, as, and, a, as a lighting guy, I can I can say you're 100% right. Yeah. And most of them that are good are out touring with somebody. Yeah. Um, so in a lot of venues, not a, a lot of great lighting guys. Um, like almost every venue I go to, I feel like, I know I can do better than that. That's um, the mentoring thing. Yeah. Honestly, it is. As someone who, like my dad obviously could speak to this better than I could, but we <clears throat> we preach to the schools all the time. Like you need to teach this stuff better. You need to have, you know, people in that can teach this stuff. And, and you know, we had a digital theater program here in town that was the only thing teaching lighting and it's gone now. They got yeah. rid of it. So that that's, to me, it goes back to what you said about, you know, the older people myself and older you know we need to be we need to be passing this knowledge down to to the you know so those those instead of you know my opinion is instead of um you know seeing these lighting guys that aren't that great going oh, aren't that great you know find the ones that are passionate enough about it because i once was you know yeah. like you said right like we all learned that way back in the day i once was and you know a guy named andy renson who used to work here uh shout out to andy is uh you know i learned a ton from andy and still learn a lot from andy uh you know on shows and stuff when you know because he has time to you know sit with some of these consoles that we buy and learn them and stuff and i just don't i have so much going on yeah and you know and i'll go on a gig and i don't know how to do something hey andy um and so you know that never stops um but the, the, I, I agree a hundred percent anyway, the, sorry, the light, yeah, the lighting thing is just like, that's a, you get my dad talking about that. That's. Oh yeah. We talk, we talk all the time. We, we send messages <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, um, well, for me, it's always being prepared for any gig is a hundred percent of the battle is that you should know your stuff. Uh, and if you don't know your stuff, then go in and spend some time. But a lot of venues, techs don't want to go in on their own time. It's like, they don't pay us to do that. But I'm like, yeah, but what are you doing during the week? If there's no shows during the week, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, you, do you have a second job that you're, that you're spending their week at? If you're home all day and you really don't have, you know, anything major going on, I'd be like, I'm going to the venue and I'm going to spend all day, you know, learning or tweaking or setting up the console. So when the next guy comes in or the next show comes in, I'm that much more prepared. Sure. But I've been to multiple venues where, you know, here's the house hang, here's the house rig. I'm going to come in. I'm going to use this 
lighting rig and you set some specials, um, you know, kind of get those things front lighting looked after. <clears throat> and then they'll have a bunch of movers and I'll be like, all right, can you show me, you know, some looks that you have? And be like, look at me like, oh, no, <laughs> they have nothing. Wow. They'll just clear the desk after the show is done and they won't have any pallets, any, any looks built and ready to go. That's terrifying. And I'm like, wow, really? Nothing? No. Wh what do you want? Okay. Um, sometimes it would be like, there's six lights up there, you know, six movers. Can you build me? And, you know, when I'm out, I'm, it's a busking situation. There's, you know, I'm going to just call out a bunch of cues and tell you what I need. You know, I'm going to need this color wash. I need these specials. I need, you know, give me a mover look. Um, and I said, can you just build me like six or seven or eight moving looks? And, and you could just see the struggle. Oh my god! And they're, gosh. you know, and they're sitting like, well, where would you want them? So there's only six lights. There's only so much, you know, this over here, across this, full, you know, um, and I'll have to sit and. You might as well do it yourself. Yeah. I, you know, if I knew lighting consoles better, I probably would just jump in and build a show and this, you know, here are your cues. Yeah. Um, and what we'll does follow it? It seems better. But then the other thing, and it's maybe just me, but it they'll have stuff built but all of a sudden you know this light crosses over to here but this light's now three feet further back than this yeah. one and that drives me it drives me insane too mental i will go in in the middle of a show and i will edit that that program yeah i will fix it if i messed up a, like one of my programs and it's it not to be I'm not being arrogant when I say this, but like I would spend a lot of time programming. Um, like I would, I would, I did a show. My dad actually just talked to me about it the other day. I did a show for the band, the tenors in Oshawa at the arena. And it was a Christmas show. Yeah. And my dad brought this insane lighting rig. It was just so many lights and, and a, you know, a spark, a, a sparkler backdrop with all the, you know, color yeah. changing backdrop. And it was, there was so much stuff. It was insane. Anyway, I programmed that lighting rig from start to finish. It was eight hours. Yeah. I programmed for eight hours straight. Like, didn't go to catering, you know, had a couple of bottles of water there. I programmed for eight hours straight. And I didn't know, but management was in the room uh, for that show. And um, anyway, I just did the show like I normally do, which is, you know, I rock the, I rock the console. Like, I, I play it like an instrument. Yeah. That's what I do. Um to your point of, you know, knowing your craft before you go out on stage and, or in my case, before you get behind the console. And so, um, that was, you know, I, I love, I love doing that show. Cause it was, it was a fun show to, to do cause it was Christmas, but it was, you know, it was the tenors. It was, it was that all that, that style of music. And I, so I really enjoyed it. Um, so it, you know, it was great. And then at the end of the show, uh, some guy in a suit comes up to me and goes, really liked what you did there and i'm like cool thanks man and there's like other people walking by it was good you know it's older people and younger people and uh yeah um and then he kind of walks away and comes back with another guy in a suit and they're like yeah so um uh so yeah uh, would you would you be willing to go on the road <laughs> i'm like where are you guys <laughs> and it was the management from the band oh yeah and they were like yeah that was the best light show and a big part of that was the programming, right? Yep. Like I knew how to run it too. Like I obviously, I, cause I'm, I, I palette a lot of stuff and I'm, I'm doing colors on the fly. And so there's, a, you know, there is some skill to it for sure. But, um, but a lot of it's in the programming. If you don't have the stuff that, if you don't have the vision and you don't have the looks and you, you can't, you can't fire them if they're not there yeah. to your point. Right. So, you know, just give me some looks and I'll make it happen. And that was what I did. And, and so, you know, programming for eight hours versus let's say 15 minutes you know, yeah. or something um it makes a huge difference yeah um so i can't even imagine going into some of these venues with wiped consoles that just blows my mind like why 
it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, and, and especially with rigs that aren't that difficult, right? No, and, and you know, house hangs that aren't super elaborate, um, and, and just nothing is really, you know, and maybe it's because they just have so many different things that come in that nothing ever works well with the other. I don't know, but. I would think when you only have so much to work with, there's only so many things you can do in the first place, right? So you're kind of, there's only so many looks and so many things you can do. So, um, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, firing, you know, uh, cues um, at a live show should be, you know, pretty standard, you know, should be pretty easy, but you know, almost every tour I just kind of walk away and just like, oh my gosh, just the lighting was just, yeah you know lots of there'll be lots of errors too in queues where all of a sudden we'll go to something and they haven't checked you know they'll i'll put lots of stuff on faders so i can call you know um things easily you know and uh uh you know the goal and they haven't checked everything so because these two faders are up we'll bring up this look and all of a sudden everything moves somewhere different because there yep. hasn't been cleared properly yep or, been there yeah it's sort of like see it over and over again. It's like, oh man. And it's, but I've learned to kind of just kind of it's like, hey, sometimes it's not their fault. And maybe sometimes, you know, they are just coming in as an extra person who, you know, he's not usually there or mm -hmm. or you know, never know the circumstance. Um I bet you that doesn't happen in Nashville though. Probably not. Not <laughs> ever. No. No. But, how does how does so there's a question. How does um how does so as a, as someone in country in Canada, and I've I've know some few, a few people that have kind of done this, is that some of them feel the need to have to go to Nashville and either write there or live there, or whatever, um, to be successful in country music. Um, how, I guess it's a two part question. Sort of does that have to happen, or can you do well in country in Canada without you know being in Nashville? Uh, Nashvilleite, that's a thing. Um, and then the second part of the, well, we'll answer that one first and then we'll get into the second Yes part. and no. In, in most cases and over the years, uh, if you didn't become big in Nashville or the US, you didn't nearly have as big a career in Canada. It's, it was kind of like a limit you can kind of get to. Okay. Um, and, you know, there's only, I, I, I still think it's true now to some degree. I think you'll get to a point where you're playing, you know, you maybe you'll, you can't get over the 2000 mark, right? For people coming out to see you, unless it's a festival or something. Um, but then the Americans will come in and they'll just do the arenas and they'll pack them. And for some reason, going to Nashville and becoming big in the U.S. or having a couple hits in the U.S., just elevates your career in Canada, just the way it is. It's hard to become, uh, a, as a country artist, just big in Canada alone. You can, you can do okay. Um, and there are uh, a bunch of them there, but um, it, it's just what, it's just kind of what you have to do. You have to, that's where everything happens in Nashville. You, you know, it's all the labels are there, all the players, all the producers are there, all the writers are there. Um, that's you have to go and and play that game so is it still so the second part of the question is is it still you know is it a big thing to have to get a deal still like do you still need a record deal in in at this state at this stage in country to 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 make a big career happen i still think so yeah uh, i think for any genre still it's not as important um it's part of the equation um you know, is there a bigger part? Is there a bigger part of the equation than than that? Do you think social media having you know, exposure? Yeah, having a good following um, can kind of get you a lot of places. Um, you know, you take. I watch a lot of YouTube. Like I don't watch TV anymore. I never used to watch YouTube at all. I thought it was just like, why would anyone do that? Now I'm one of those people who kind of I have like a list of subscribe subscribe let's subscribe to and it's all completely different you know just very little music um 
but it's just from one thing to another. Sure. But you get hooked and all of a sudden you realize oh, some of these people have five, six, seven, eight, ten million 10 million people watching these. It's like, what TV show has that many people watching? Totally. Nothing, Nothing. you know? Like even CNN, they average, I think some of the shows average under 500,000 a show. Yeah. 100%. And that's CNN. Yeah. And yeah, that's showing everywhere. And so you got. It's shown in airports. It's yeah. Shown in and everywhere. Yeah. And we have situations like this where, you know, people are sitting and they have a couple of cameras, one camera, they have an iPhone, and they've got millions of people watching and it's engaging. And if you can build that crowd, um, I think that's, you know, the people who are on top of their social media game yeah. seem to be doing really well. Yeah, g good on the people that jumped on that during the pandemic and stayed relevant through that, right? Yeah. Because that was partly how they did it. But it's not everything. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's like anything. It's it's luck who you know, um, who wants to put the money into it. You know, that's a big part of it now, eh? Oh, so much money. It's it's insane. If you don't have yeah, uh, like deep, if you don't have deep pockets. Like I heard, it's, I heard even years ago, this is, and this is probably like four or five years ago now that it took a million dollars to break a single properly in the U S and, and I don't even remember quite where that stack came from, but it was like, you know, to, to hire radio pluggers and just the, the whole thing, like to, you know, the, the, to do, you know, promotional tours and just everything that was involved with, you know, with that. And so, it, yeah, it's, you know, what who's got that kind of money to take, take a risk on, on a song, let alone, you know, a whole album, <laughs> you know, let alone a whole yeah. project. Right. Like, but it's not different than social media. You look at, you know, I look at some of the people I follow on YouTube and it's like, I don't really know why that person has 5 million people watching an episode, but I like it. Yeah. Um, there's no particular reason. Some of it, I'm sure there's probably a hundred other people doing the same thing, as good or maybe even better but for some reason that person took off do you think it's consistency mm -hmm. is that a big part of it yeah, that's what i hear from almost everybody it's like you just got to keep at it um i you know i had a podcast over um in session yeah in session with darren walters um did a whole lot of there episodes yep um and it was great but I knew it was going to be a grind. Like you have to keep producing, producing, producing. And I just didn't think I was able to keep that going. When, you know, during COVID I had, you had time. I had time. But usually I don't have that amount of time. No, you're here for a couple of weeks right now and then you're gone on the road again or something, right? Yeah, there's always something. So I do wear many hats. So there's always something happening and just devote that amount of time to it. Um, I just kind of had to make a decision. It's like, you know what? I think I'm out for a while. And it was getting, um, it's getting busy. Like it was like, you have to, it was just me. So yeah, that's, that's I was out there getting gas and then arranging all their information doing the podcast i was videotaping it as well um over zoom edit you know and then all the work of getting the graphics together um my nephew sky scotter uh, would help out a bit uh he put some graphics together for me he's really good at that um but still you know you have to post it here you got to post it there um and it was just it was a lot of work and, and frustrating at times too where you you did a lot of work you know i'd send people here's all the artwork you need if you want to post um about it we have this great conversation we finish up and you know you get a follow-up email from someone say hey that was one of the best conversations i've ever had it was really great and i really enjoyed that thank you and it's like oh isn't that awesome and then they don't push it out they don't pu they don't say anything they don't push uh, they don't do anything brutal yeah so but i understand that because you know, I'm just this little guy doing a podcast and they're a big star and they, you know, they enjoyed it. They had a great time, but there wasn't anything 
you know, if I was a CBS special or something, you know, 60 minute spot or something, yeah, they'd, they'd probably be, post yeah. it and it would be the same thing, right? Sure. I probably had more interesting conversation than you would get on some shows. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I listened to a pile of the episodes. Yeah, there's lots of great content and we've 100%. had long format, right? I like the long format. Um, but yeah, it was, um, I, I knew it was going to be a, a grind to kind of keep it going. So I'm anxious to kind of maybe do it again, get, you know, get it, maybe not do as many. Um, but, uh, you have to really stick with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Consistent. I, I knew kind of, <clears throat> it's funny. I actually, you know, when I started doing this you know i thought of you like because i obviously my dad was on your show yeah and he still raves about it i've listened to that episode that my dad did um at least five times cool because every time i listen i i i hear something that i didn't really didn't sink in the last time but you know i learned things he said things on that podcast about you know our family and my brother and me and just in general that like you know resonated with me and i'm his son i'm around him we work together all the time so um i think that i love the long format too and i yeah. think that it it really helps people even people really close to the person um to to learn things and understand things about the person and what they go through and what they've gone through and and what they're dealing with uh with you know with cr crazy tds that that theater is um uh you know which is really cool but uh i also it, you know i've got a little more time than you to to do it i think but only just a little so i i kind of i kind of know what i signed up for when i saw you doing it because i was like wow he's really pumping out the episodes yeah and, i had uh, some great conversations i mean talk to bob barker you yeah, know it's just like that's unreal and i had a great conversation and, and like different people that i feel like the, the cool thing about it, um, and, I, and I'm going to be stuck with his name, Keith Urban's bass player, uh, and it will come to me. Oh, in a, in yeah, a and I listened to that episode, too. Um, it was so good. So I ran into him uh, in Fort Lauderdale at the uh, Hollywood Casino. Uh, went there to eat. I was on this last tour. We got into Fort Lauderdale, went over to the casino to have a bite to eat. Keith was performing that night. I'm heading out the door. Sure enough, comes by. It's like, hey, it's there. And we did the podcast. Oh man, I just and then we just had this great conversation where it would have been just, hey man, I really like your your playing, dude. <laughs> and and you there would have been nothing, right? And there's there's a bunch of people that I've talked to that now will um it was my birthday yesterday. I got some emails or messages. Was your birthday yesterday? Yeah. Happy birthday, birthday, man. Thanks, man. Um, I got some messages from people I did podcasts with that, you know, I just had the conversation with them and they're like people who perform with big artists and different things. And it's just like Jerry Flowers. Jerry Flowers, thank you. You're the man. <laughs> <laughs> I was out totally to, stuck with that. Shout out to Jerry. Yeah. And he was really nice. Great super podcast. nice. Great. Yeah. It was awesome. Great player. And um yeah that was that was a fun podcast you know you really got you know really went back to kind of felt with you always assume that you're playing with a huge artist and you know everyone thinks everything's rosy and everything's you know great not that there was anything wrong with playing with keith or any of those things there was all great but then you realize the struggle getting there right and yeah and the struggle still um because a lot of these artists are not always playing or always touring. So there's that totally. downtime. Um, and that's another issue is, is being a, a backup player for X artist. It's okay when you're out touring, but when that artist decides to take a year off, oof, you know, yeah. or take two years off because they can, and you just been out on the road for two years, everyone forgets about you. You, yeah. you, you get forgotten about in town so yeah staying, also, staying relevant gets tough then, yeah sure. so you have to come back and then you have to reestablish yourself to wherever you are and try to reach out to um you know people try to get work again and and when you're in it you're in it so um yeah that's almost why like i know a couple of people um 
around me that that play like this guy this young guy josh try he's he's right in, he's in texas king right now the the canadian rock band that's that's touring around with thornley um uh, josh is one of those guys he just plays in like you know 10 different bands um and the one that's kind of moving the right direction at the time and has the money and all those factors gets him right but he's yeah. just such a talented player and the same with bunch right like bungie you know he's on retainer i think with bnl like it's you know, it's, it's kind of that thing where, you know, they got them, but then when they're off the road and there's no studio time, you know, he's like, okay, what's next? And, yeah. and there was a time, part of why he's here even is because there was a time where, um, he wasn't on retainer and, and, you know, again, they came off the road and, and Cochran wasn't playing any gigs at the time. And, you know, he, he was doing stuff with Gord Downey, but Gord's passed away now from the hip. And so all of a sudden it's like, well, what do I, what do I do? And and then this opportunity to, to, to you know, do the London guitars thing and the, came up and, and uh, it made sense because he's yeah. like, yeah, when I'm not on the road, now I can keep setting up guitars and, and meet cool people. And, you know, so yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta find a way to stay relevant and stay, yeah. stay in it. Sure. Yeah. And it's tough, you know, especially being a musician in Canada, as I mentioned before, there's only so many places to play. So you either be, have to be really diverse and play with, a lot of different people or you know you really have to find something else to do and it's flexible that you can come and go when you want i mean that's how many places can you go work where you can say okay well i got a tour i'm going to be gone for a month and then come back and just slip right back in again it's it's hard to do that's why i didn't go out with the tenors yeah they offered me a world tour no well, and i said no yeah. because i would have had to have left this place for almost a year yeah or whatever it was six to eight months there's no way yeah so yeah it's it's, it's tough because there's great guys out like you that you know would do fantastic for them but yeah you've got something else going on and it's hard to be those positions aren't you know when you're really good they pay well uh, but they don't pay crazy yeah, I'm not going to leave my business behind that I spent the last 25 years building. Yeah, like it's not that type of money. You know, no. it's not it's not going to be like, oh, I can just sell everything and this is going to that. No, and it's not always about money either, right? Yeah. Like you, like you said, you have to, and, and again, not that I didn't like to pee. Those guys were great. I mean, but you do have, to, it's, there's more than that. You have to like the guys you're on the road with. It's like yeah. family, right? As you know. And so you have to really like the people you're out with. You have to like the music. You have to, so yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> It's a journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, you might go back to going into some of these venues I was talking about and and guys aren't really prepared as well as they should be. Um, it that's just comes down to a work ethic for me. And I find that work ethic is, is not where it should be for a lot of people. Um, but I'm used to working. Um, you know, I know you used to work and your dad certainly, you know, you said you probably get stop. that from, yeah. But that makes great people, makes great businesses, makes great, you know, you can always rely on those, those people, you know, they're going to come through and being prepared and, and all those things that you know that, um, you know, at our venue, um, people come in and leave and they're like, wow, that's like one of the best experiences we ever had at the theater before. And I always, they'll leave and I'm like, why would they say that about our 180 seat theater? But what I think the advantage is I've been in every single one of their shoes, right? I've, I've been a musician, I tech and I do a bunch of different things. So as a musician coming in, I, I know exactly what I would want when I came in, which is like everything's set up, everything's tested, all the lines have been checked. You've done some preliminary checks, you know, and mixes in, in place. You made sure that there's extra power, extra cables, extra this. There's a problem. Bam, you got, oh, you need a, and you almost always you like, someone's going to need a guitar stand, you know? <laughs> yep. You know, there's someone's like, hey, do you have a guitar stand around here? Someone might need an extra quarter inch cable. Yeah. So those little, I always have them. You know, it's like, yep, yeah, right here. Or, or just have them sitting there. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, cool. Look, a guitar stand. Oh, cool. I got hangers around oh, the stage. 
sitting there. I even I got fiddle hangers for for someone came and said, like, oh man, I've never ever, ever seen that before, right? Ever, ever. So I've never seen it. So yeah, it's you just do those extra little things so that when they come in, th- there is it's as smooth as smooth can possibly be. Cause we've all been to lots of venues and I'm sure people listening who go to shows, you get there, nothing, no gears out yet. Um, they haven't placed monitors. They haven't um, tested monitors. They haven't checked lines and you just come in, you gotta wait for all the stuff to, to get done. Or they haven't looked at the rider properly. I filled in in a theater in Toronto for a couple of dates. And uh, this jazz group came in from, I think they were from Chicago, this kind of real cool horn section and a nice section. On the, oh, cool. And I laid out the stage and uh, they came in and said, like, wow, who laid out the stage? And I thought, oh crap, <laughs> what did I do wrong? <laughs> and they were like, <laughs> nobody has ever got it right. Hmm. That's and cool. I had it right, but it wasn't difficult. You just looked and you made sure you, you make like really good look and you realize all oh, the drum rise is a little off center. Oh, this is a little bit over here. And you make those details. adjustments and you just make sure the details are done right. Details, man. Yeah. That's like the hangers. That's details. It's all that stuff. Yeah. And it, it's individually, it maybe seems like a little thing, but when you have enough of those things, checked off i feel like it's what makes that 180 seat venue pro you know like that's what separates you from the rest is you have all those little all those little things not just one of them or two of them or three of them you have a whole pile of them checked off right so i i i I had a great experience there with we brought my grandma there for walter austin oh yeah yeah yeah. i forgot about that walter and uh well we're quite a bit more than it's way more than that now yeah yeah but yeah yeah. but that was um, but that for me, just being able to talk about the experience, the experience was fantastic. Cool. Like just, you know, cause it's a, it's a country vibe, obviously, right. It's on the farm and, yeah. and that's already a, a pretty awesome energy out there. Right. And with, you know, sort of the peacefulness of the country. And then, you know, this, this, this really old, but awesome, you know, sort of structure. And then, and then you go inside and the staff that were, you know, cause you were doing uh food service yeah. at that point. And it, the staff were great. And so, you know, and, and it all adds up, right? Um, and so, you know, and the sound man was pretty good. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> but no, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. I and, mean, you know, my grandma still talks about it. Um, it was the last time she ever saw him and she's a big polka fan. And, but, um, but yeah, I mean, what's, here's another question. What's, and this is, I guess, probably a different answer depending on what we're talking about. But um, how do you sort of measure success? What is I will we'll talk about, I guess, from the artist standpoint. Um, like what what is what is you know what does success look like? Because I've talked to people about this on the podcast in the past, and and you know, I have my sort of thing about what realistic success looks like. Some people think success is like doing those stadium tours, but I'm, but that's, you know, while that should be a, a goal, maybe if that's where you want to go, um, that's not sustainable for every single person that wants to do it. Right. Yeah. So what does it look like in, in your, in your world? For me, like you mentioned, depends what I'm doing. Sure. Yeah, sure. But if everybody's happy and the show went well, and the audience had a good time yeah then i'm happy um i will never be like uh happy with any show i've done like i wouldn't say happy i wouldn't be say i've nailed every show because i don't think you can ever be that good right i've had shows that i think have been great you know it's like oh that was great um could I have done this better? Could I have done that better? Could I have done this better? Always. Again, my mind is always like, how could I have made that better? Like, okay, next time out, we're going to go into, how can we make this better? We're doing the exact same thing, exact same everything. We have to make it better. Um, and I think the same thing with our, our, our venue. Um, 
you know, the next year's coming around and my mind's already twirling and sort of like, I'm going to buy some more lights, you know? And it's like, I don't need them on stage, but I want to start lighting everything around, like, you know, doing a bunch of up lights and all the beams and all this stuff. It's like, I'm going to add a little more, make it a little bit better, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's constant not being just satisfied is where you are it's like how can we always make it better not being hard on yourself being like okay you know oh, i really sucked you know that you know it's not that <laughs> right right if you've done the prep and you've done your work you should be happy with what happens and if people leave and they're happy you can have mistakes things can happen on stage um you know one of my biggest things i always tell some musicians if you make a mistake, don't let everyone in the audience know. Yeah, keep rolling. Because most of the time, they don't know you made a mistake. No. Unless it's really, really obvious. But <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> like, I see, like, like half the PA goes down or something. Yeah. Then they know. But most of the time, no one knows this, right? Yeah. If it's a good show, everyone's having a good time. The light goes flying over this way and it should have been this way. It's like, okay, that drives me crazy. But just as not, let's not do it again. And just go with the flow um i've kind of learned more lately just kind of just be more accepting of people and where they're at because you don't know the circumstance right i've been in many circumstances where uh, i might be out in the show there's a show I was, I was touring with um you know they did a lot of tracks the tracks didn't sound very good mm. um but i was stuck with them so it made a huge difference to what my mix sounded like. So I had to get over that and deliver a good show. And people were leaving and like, oh man, that was so much fun. I had the best time, blah, blah, blah. That's great. That's what you want. You know, you don't, I think so many techs, so many musicians are so worried about uh, trying to impress the musician next to them yeah instead of worrying about trying to impress the people who paid the ticket to see it putting on the show man yeah so yeah. uh you know when i go out as a performer i always try my best to make it look like i'm you know doing something amazing you know having fun yeah having a good time yeah. i can make mistakes i'll laugh about it we'll have fun and and you know uh, if people see you having a good time, they may not know why you're laughing. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that, right? <laughs> yeah. And everyone's laughing on stage. You're doing, you know, you treat it like that. Like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a respect, right? And, but if you make a mistake, you're like, oh, you know, you just kind of make a face like, I can't believe I did that. Or you make it obvious. People are like, well, what happened there? They don't understand. And just never show anybody, um, you know, what happened. You just keep, keep rolling and you know as long as it's not something that happens over and over again but i think success success is what you make it right yeah and everyone has a different level of what they want to achieve um you know mine is kind of never ending you know it's just i don't feel like i'll ever get to a spot where i figured i've done it right i just always feel like i want to learn i want to get better i always want to make the situation better i'm going to make the people around me better um you just keep you just keep trucking yeah as long as you're happy and uh is there kids in the walter family not many no there is uh uh skyler who's my sister's boy yeah uh both myself and my brother we have chosen not to get married mm -hmm. so far <laughs> <laughs> could still, still time left could still happen um so yeah, it's 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 shrunk for sure, but um Scott is great. He's um he's got the music bug and he's he loves he's really he's really into graphics animation and all that stuff. He's he's got that down. I what's one of the questions I have for you was what's a good age? Um you you mentioned you guys you started at four. Yeah. Um what's a good age for people to get their kids into playing into music into into all of it really as young as possible i yeah. think but only and i think this applies to sports or anything um 
only take it as far as you think they're willing to go. Yeah. yeah. And you will know. Um, and I used to teach years ago. Used oh, really? to do, yeah. I used I to do know. a lot of vocal coaching. Um, I did a lot of that. And you can tell whether somebody has it or has the ambition to do it or they don't. Right. And I wasn't a good teacher because I'd be like, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is for them. You know, right. you could just tell they're, you know, they'd come the next week and they hadn't practiced. They hadn't mm. done this. There was no, yeah, they didn't you know, want it bad enough. No, they didn't want it bad enough. Yeah. Now we can keep going and it's something they, you know, a skill that you learn, which is good. Um, uh, but you always got to look for that passion. So, you know, they get home and they're right back to doing it again, or they can't, you know, they're up in their room, they're playing guitar all night. Um, it's a passion. And if they don't have that inkling to want to get to it all the time, then just let it go, you know? And it could just be the wrong instrument too. Totally. I, I, I've seen that happen, right? Where parents, do, they don't want electric guitar in the house, you know, so they... They buy them an acoustic and they're playing all these songs that you play on an acoustic, but really they want to play metal, like they want to play metal or they want to play, you know, whatever, you know, hard rock or whatever it is. Um, uh, or, or completely the opposite. They want to play drums or they want to yeah. whatever, but it's, uh, I've seen that too. I think it's tough that I think as a parent, you, you put on to your children, your wishes that didn't happen to you. Right. So Maybe you wanted to be a guitar player when you're young, but it never happened. You didn't have that skill. They transfer that over to their kids. Yeah. They want to see their life through them. And that's person may not have anything to do with, you know, what their parents wanted to do. Right. Totally. You got to find the happy medium where, you know, encourage, but really watch and see what, they want to do because everyone has something they're really good at it's just finding out what it is i asked my daughter like mm -hmm. she we tried piano with her and you know shout out to peter i mean he did he did great trying to get her into it and um and she had one teacher before that that she was going to too but i think she's just too young to stay focused you yeah. know um and so she you know she would kind of goof off and and in the lesson and really wasn't focused um, but I asked her, uh, you know, we told her, you know, we're going to stop, we're going to take a break. Um, and I said to her, I said, one day I said, cause she loves in my car, she gets in my car, she wants my phone and she's in the back seat and she's singing along, you know, she's singing along with the beach boys. She's singing along with all these different songs. And, um, I said to her one day, we were getting ready to go to school. And I said, Sophie, would you like to take singing lessons? And she goes, Yeah. And I could see it in her face. I'm like, yeah. ah, right. So that's why I mentioned, you know, maybe they're just doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Cause that was an experience I just had with my first, with my four-year-old. And, and, and then something even more interesting happened where she, and she's four. So she comes back to me and she goes, daddy, if, if I do the singing lessons and I'm good at it, can I do piano again with Peter? And I'm like, aha. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I, it was, that was a really, that was a big aha moment for me. Right. And thankfully it happened on my first and when she was four. So now I'm kind of like, Ooh, like exactly what you said. I'm like, okay, now I just have to not push anything on them. Like that was, and you know, kudos to my wife. She tries to get, you know, my kids into as many different things as possible, which is f phenomenal. But again, it is a lot of what she grew up doing, right? A lot of the yeah. things are, you know, ballet and all these things that she grew up doing. And it's great, um, but, you know, we realized, thankfully, fairly early on that, you know, okay, Sophie's not ready for this. Yeah. But going and, and just asking her, hey, would you would you like to try this? And, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll try it and it'll be a train wreck. <laughs> but but she was, but I could see the passion. I could see yeah. she was excited about it. Yeah. You know, when I asked her. So I think it's the issue with almost everybody. If you get up in the morning and you have no passion to go to work and do what you're doing, it's not great. I mean, it's, you have to find something that you makes you want to get up in the morning 
and and you know and it's always one of those things which the question i sometimes bring would you do this with for no money that's a great question and everything i do i would do in a heartbeat if you know there was no money in it or or portions of it or someone say hey would you do this you know we don't have any money but we can do this if i wanted you know yeah sure you know you're not going to do it all the time but you know there's it's that thing a question like would you you know spend a bunch of time doing this um just to either get better or you know not get paid and if you're like yeah i'd absolutely do it that's your thing right it's just because yeah. it's something you really really enjoy um i agree 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. Uh, you know there's there's lighting gigs i've had where i would have done it for free there's i did my music conference in toronto cdj show and and same thing like the the people i met the relationships i formed the the connection just the the good people the the knowledge i took from that just everything i mean it was it was invaluable i never made a dime doing it we actually i lost money doing that conference for nine years but what i got out of that yeah uh, was was priceless yeah and i i would do it again in a heartbeat if 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 it made sense but right now the genre and everything just doesn't make sense but it's um yeah i agree 100 percent. it's a great question to ask is i'm sure most people listening do not ask themselves that because i certainly don't on a regular basis yeah and if you find yourself saying no then you know i think you and i are similar we we both do a bunch of different things right yeah and when you do a bunch of different things, there's always a few of those things are gonna fall short, right? Because there's just not enough time to put 100% into multiple things. You know, it's gonna be one's always gonna take the lead, right? Yep. And so sometimes you have to kind of go, you know, and, you know, clear the fat if you wanna, you know, say that. You just kind of, okay, stuff here isn't getting to where it should be. Does it make sense for me to, and that's sort of like when I, I did the podcast, or it was like, I just couldn't see doing this, you know, for the next 10 years, uh, maybe I could have stuck with it and it would have just really taken off. You just have no idea, or you just, you were so far out of your control um, that I just, you know, I just like, I can't, I just can't take this gamble. It just doesn't make sense, but I got a lot out of it and I, I'm really glad I did it um but yeah it's a lot of things you just kind of look and you know sometimes you got to go okay this is this maybe i don't need to do this anymore and spend more time doing this speaking of which what what does the future look like for you what are you going to keep spending time doing i don't know i just turned 54 and i feel like i haven't accomplished anything close to what i want to accomplish <laughs> you sound like my dad yeah <laughs> you guys are you guys are it's funny that you guys are friends because it's like that's something he would say because he's you know yeah it's he's he's he'll never be done it'll, it'll yeah finish. i don't i don't think i will be done either i mean it's just i feel i think when the brain stops churning that's the time but like you know, I can sit and at night and or on the drive and I'll be thinking of a million different things. And it's all, you know, work related because it's fun. Right? Like, you know, it's like, oh, okay, how can I change the studio? Oh, how can I do this? Well, well, what are you gonna do with this? And and you just kind of your brain is constantly churning. And even when I'm home, you know, like I said, I'm a big YouTube guy. There's a part of that that's just purely entertainment. Sure. Right. Yeah. But then there's another part where it's just I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. I want to, you know. Absolutely. Especially I'm a gear guy. I've always, um, you know, I've, I started as a musician. I would say I'm always a musician. And maybe that's my strongest suit. I don't know. But I have a, such a passion for tech that it, I always get drawn that way. You know, I'm always, I'm not at home looking at other fiddle players play on YouTube or seeing what the latest there is some fiddle technology <laughs> it just never ever comes up for me right sure. but i want to know you know the latest <coughs> equipment and and what how to you know um how this guy is mixing and how this person is mixing and how i could improve what i'm doing to make it 
you know, make it better or uh, all that stuff. I feel like I just constantly want to learn more stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's, that's the battle I have is, you know, when do you stop learning? You don't, you know? Um, but I think for me, if the brain stops churning out, wanted to do stuff, you know, new ideas and wanted to learn, it's probably time to, you know, stop. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, people ask me, they're like, they're like, uh, you ever going to, you ever going to take over the business? I'm like, take over the business for my dad. He'll never retire. Um, but I'm the same. I, he's the same. I'm the same as you. We're constantly turned. Like I, I'll get to a red light and I'll have so many things turning out mostly work related mm. again, like you said, in my head, I got to pull my phone up quickly and hit the, hit the mic button and, and notepad it just so I can. <laughs> retain some of it yeah it's, and i should do that it's, more. it's like a, it's like a fire hose sometimes yeah i've mm -hmm. lost so many good ideas from the top of the stairs to the bottom you totally know, yeah you get down it's like oh what was i just oh man that was such a good idea and you're just like that totally gone and, and that's such a songwriter thing like i was i did a, an episode with my buddy jay allen and we talked about that about like when you have an idea for a song i think the context was you know you're you're sleeping and you wake up and you have this idea and i and i said like what do you he's like you got to get out your phone and just sing it into the phone yeah doesn't matter what you're doing <laughs> you just got to get it down because otherwise it's it's gone yeah you know yeah because there's so much going on um it's you know and it's not forefront it's just back there you know so it's not right on the forefront of your brain it's just kind of brewing back there on simmer right so you just it's it's so easily gone i find you know, I have ideas and stuff all the time and I'll be on my way home or something. I get home and it's like, oh, what was that again? And he just, it's just totally gone. It's yeah. Just, that's old age too. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Where do people find you? Uh, usually I, I send this people to like Facebook or Instagram, Darren Walters. Cool. Darren Walters one, I think it's on Instagram. Still got a website, Darren Walters. Yeah, DarrenWalters.com. Um, I don't do much on the website, uh, but you can get to all my links there. How do they find um, the How do they find the venue? Uh, venue is WaltersMusicVenue.com. Uh, you can see all of our shows, uh, shows pictures of the venue and all that stuff. So, and what um, about the touring stuff that you're doing? Where Where do they find all that? Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> look Look at your local almost sold out theater. <laughs> I uh, we try to keep a low profile with that stuff we okay. kind of come in and out of town and yeah. you know i'll post on face that's why i say facebook is is best because i usually kind of that's what i keep up for when i'm touring and nice. and you know this is where i am i always try to do a venue shot of some sort um and uh but um yeah people don't really understand what i do and in that end of things because i end up doing front of house quite a bit most of the tours now i'm a co-promoter on so you know they don't understand i'm running that role most people just think i'm i'm in as you know i'm the sound guy for the show and and um you know but it's you know much 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 more than that so i just happen to do sound so it just easier for me to do it than hire another guy and pay another guy to come when i can just do it myself totally so, yeah. Well, you're used to doing that. You're you're used to that from the from the venue. Yeah, I'm very used to multitasking, so I can multitask quite well. I've actually functioned better when I've got five things on the go at the same time than one. Like I live for one of these tours, I used to do sound, uh, run tracks, call lighting, and follow spot all at the same time. <laughs> and i'd be just brain just firing at 100 percent, right and the show would be done i'm like oh gosh what happened and guys on the call will be like dude i've never seen someone do that before that was really cool <laughs> <laughs> but you just get laser focused right it's the same thing as we talked about singing where you have to get yourself to a place and i just knew when i sat down it was 30 seconds to show it was just like everything goes quiet around me and it's just stage calm 
calm in and out because I don't wear calm when I'm doing audio. I just have one of those telephone you gotta, hands. You got to have your ears open. Back and forth is constant and you just know what's going on all the time. So um, it's hard, um, especially in the live show situation. And it, it's funny, in our theater, I mix side stage, uh, which is unusual, which I would never do anywhere except I know our venue so well, it works for me. Sure. And I see everything, you know, because you're right there. So anyone makes a mistake, anything's going on. Usually the artists at our place uh, are in for like a week or two weeks at a time. So I always get comments all the time because I'll be sitting mixing and something happened. I'll just kind of look up and the drummer would have done a look or something, you know, and I said, just kind of look up to see what happened. And it says, dude, you see everything. Makes me really nervous. <laughs> 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 but it's just your brain's, you know, picking up on all those little things. So, totally. uh, but it's fun. I like it. It's, it's neat. But yeah, Walter's music venue. Uh, it's a great, a great spot um, to see a live show. It's very intimate. It's 180 seats, but it doesn't feel like a 180 seat venue because the, the building's so massive. I mean, it's just a big barn. It's, the ceilings are so high and it's, um, it's a big venue I go into venues that are like 600 seats on the road i said like, god this place feels smaller than ours um but it's just because of low ceiling or something like that it just makes you feel more crammed but at our venue it's very open and and uh you get you know most people don't think you sure it's only 100 yeah i know it's 180 seats um, and before we run i know you got a studio yeah. there too right yep that was really my my passion for a very very long time and i think i just burnt out um from doing it and i like i don't like being just stuck in a room all the time you know i like i get that yeah i have to do other things so i think that was part of it too it's just i just i don't want to be in this room for the rest of my life and not go out and do other things so yeah um so it's not as busy as it used to be um but i'm totally cool with that i kind of do you know few projects a year where I just, you know, someone wants to do a project with me or, or at the studio or have me mix something or produce something. I'll do that if time permits. And, but I don't put it out there for like, Hey, you know, studio come, you know, so much per hour and come on in. Um, I just kind of like to just have something come to me and that's, if I'm available, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Where I mean, we're here in this building, we got the Charterhouse studio and uh, it, it's it's kind of the same thing right now. It is anyway, we're, we're ramping it up again, but the studio world is a, is a, it's a tough go with, with home recording what it is and yeah. just, you know, everything. Um, it's a tough go. It's funny. I actually saw, um, uh, there's a book that I just got from someone here in town that just wrote a, wrote a book and it's got a lot of photos in it. And one of the photos shows uh, an ad, a newspaper ad from, uh, it had to have been the 80s, maybe even, you know, further back. I'm not quite sure, but it was definitely an older ad. And it said, you know, professional recording studio, 50 bucks an hour. And I'm like, wow, things haven't really changed that much in 30 years, you know? No, musician rates and all that stuff haven't really changed much out of the last. It's mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, but there's only... You know, I, I know a lot of people talk about that too. It's like, you know, the, the musician rate really hasn't gone up. Um, but I take a look at touring and even uh, our venue. We have a budget. I mean, we can only afford so much. Uh, so yep. it, it makes it difficult. And um, we can only afford if we're if I'm hiring a group, which I do quite, a, quite often. I'll bring an artist in. I'll, I'll put a band together for him. This is what, you know, I always, I always start every conversation with, this is what we have, you know, and, and even when I'm booking shows, I always start, this is what I can afford. This is what I can give you. I can give you a bunch of days. Um, and you know, we'd love to have you I understand if it's not in your ballpark, but, um, you know, just lay it all out yeah. and it, it works, you know, if there's no. It's not a, a big negotiation and, and sometimes I'll throw it out to 
a tribute show just for curiosity to see what they think they're they think they they should get um and it's always you know a, a, some ridiculous price and um and it, it those are will be an act that you know i could have in and if we don't get it i'm not you know i know i can find something else but um it's i'm you know i'm always curious sometimes too just to have someone quote me just to to see where they're you know, yeah where they're at where they're sitting totally um but yeah just always lay it out um because i know what we can afford and and it's you know probably going to be a little under than what they're used to for the size of our venue but i can also give them you know two weeks uh of work which a lot of canadians don't understand that's uh i have a tough time buying canadian shows because Canadian show wants a Saturday night rate for a Monday afternoon. Uh -huh. And it, I just, I can't do it. Right. So right. But I'm going to give you 12 shows and, and I'll be like, I just went to your website. You only have six shows booked this year. I'm going to double what you have. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can be home at night in your own bed. Everything's provided um it's an easy gig you'll have a blast and a lot of a lot of canadians will be like no they they need this for you know it's like you sure you're gonna you're gonna be <laughs> at home on monday tuesday wednesday thursday probably and where the american artists they're all over that you know we can keep that machine rolling we can play monday tuesday wednesday thursday we're in we're on a plane from california i, I can i can hire shows from california with flights um more reasonably than i can buy a lot of uh canadian shows is it just because there's less ego do you think more uh no i don't think it's an ego it's just i think because in canada there's so little amount of opportunity to perform mm. trying to maximize the return the return from it yeah right uh so they just get used to that um which is fine um i you know i'd always love to pay as much as i possibly can you know um but there's for us we have a limit uh in a lot of places you do uh just got off the road doing like i said 800 to 2500 seat venues doesn't mean you have a whole lot more uh money to spend on if you're a thousand seat venue First of all, if you fill a thousand seats, you know, makes a difference, but you're still sitting at 350 people and you're paying for a thousand seat theater. Yeah, um, right. It's even a higher cost. Yeah. So, you know, you've got someone wanted to uh, uh, work with us to, to go out on a tour and, you know, talking about pricing of the tour and, and it was high. Um, and uh you know talked about wanting percentage of you know uh uh kind of like a back-end deal you know so you know if you make money they get a percentage of of you know on top of their fee so my my reply back is okay so what happens when we lose on a money you're gonna do we get money back that same percentage <laughs> yeah i've had this conversation back? before and they're like well what do you mean well, you want to take a percentage when we make money. So when we lose money, we must get a certain percentage back. And they didn't want that, mm -hmm. right? So they want to win when you win, but they want to keep winning when you lose. So, um, you know, it's like, no, that doesn't work that way. Nope. No. So. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so there you go. So yeah. Thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate no it. I know we talked a little, little bit about everything yeah yeah covered it all yeah but and then some for, and then some well, yeah. thanks for coming on yeah i love love your family and your you guys are great and uh you've uh i've always kind of admired what you guys have done and um you know i look up to your dad a lot he's a great guy and of course uh you and your brother and and uh the rest of the family i you know i wish you much success and enjoy doing business with you and and enjoy hanging with you too so that's good thanks man yeah. Appreciate it. You bet. Awesome.
Thanks for watching, everybody. This is Ryan from Music City Live signing off with Darren Walters. Make sure you check Darren's podcasts out. They're still all posted up on YouTube and all of the various platforms in session with Darren Walters. And uh, check out Darren's uh, uh, Facebook and stay tuned for shows at the, the Walter Stanley venue. Take care, everybody. See you in the next episode. Thank you for watching Music City Live. If you liked this episode, like the video. And for more clips and episodes, subscribe to the channel. Feel free to join the conversation by commenting below and visit us at musiccitylifeshow.com.